Hello, me again. On this video, I'd like to have a look at what I mentioned in the in in, in the second video I put out. Um, the four seals. Sorry, I'll be referring to another computer screen. And uh, just so just so we can be looking directly at the Word of God, and we're not just thumb sucking. So we are, we, as I mentioned in the previous video, um, we'll be studying directly from the Word of God and uh, looking at what it says. Right, so I also mentioned we'll be kicking off from Revelation 6, because this is where the action really starts, that it really occurs in the end times, um, I believe. Um, the churches um, probably were for the end times, as well um, um, as it speaks about the characteristics of the different churches. And uh, so I would believe that it didn't happen really at the time when Jesus spoke to them, but probably would also be a characteristic that the churches, or, or, or perhaps even individuals, have taken up um, in their hearts as to what their, their thinking about God really is and their service to God and their worship of God. So that could very well be an end time prediction. A scroll appears and it is um, sealed with seven seals. And the whole of heaven appears to be in the morning because there's, there's not a single person that is worthy of opening the seals and therefore opening the scroll. It would be important to know that this is scroll, which probably means the kicking off of the end time. So uh, this has probably been declared, um, you know, by the Father that here is the here, here is the the, uh, the the contract that kicks off the end times. But it can't be it it can't be uh, um, um, effective till it's opened. So there are some minor things that occur in it, but they, um, but they in fact do happen, and they do signify the beginning of the end. Um, so we'll look at each of them. We are studying out of the King James Version. Uh, for some of those, uh, me too, I'm also a King James person, and I believe it's probably the most accurate of, of all the versions. Um, I'm not discrediting the other versions anyway. It's just that, when I needed to know exactly what something had said, I would always refer to the King James Version. Um, as I know, there's probably no uh, uh, space for, for any uh, fault finding um, that, can, that might occur with the other versions. All right, so in Revelation 6, verse 1, and I saw when the Lamb open one of the seals. We know it's the first seal because there's, there's no other seals been opened. So we're using our deduction. It's the first seal, right? Uh, and I heard as it, as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. So we know when John enters heaven, he is He's put into a scenery where there's a throne, angels, 24 elders, but he also notices four beasts. Um, these are not seen as we know any living creatures here on earth. Um, they do replicate some of the creatures that we have here on earth, but these appear in front of the throne, and when they speak, they speak like thunder. So they are also worshipping God. Um, that they're also part of his creation. But they they appeared to me in my mind quite tall, uh, bigger than than probably humans are, um, and and majestic, uh, full of power, um, but submission to the throne. Um, so the a beast is inviting John to come and see. <clears throat> Notice that word and, Revelation 6.2, and, conjunctive. In other words, or a different thing is that this idea 
carries on from the previous verse. So notice the word and. Right, so this is the same story. Behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Right, there's lots in there's quite a lot of information in this verse. And uh, I could actually do an entire video on this verse, but just, just keep it shorter, we're going to rush through a little bit. Right, so John's given a vision of a horse. Notice that the um, the most prominent figure is the horse. Right. And the person that is on the horse is just described as him. And he that sat on him, okay, it's on the horse, but he that sat on the horse. So we're not giving much information about who's sitting on the horse. So many times when, you know, watching videos, we're given de depictions or, or, or pictures of the, this, the rider on this, on this white horse is a white rider as well. And nothing says about, in fact, that he's a white rider. It says the horse is white. Right. And he that said on him had a bow. Right, so why is God not describing this person on the horse? Well, because it's not important um, what he is or who he is. If you go through the book of Revelation, you'll notice that God uses angels and disasters, stars and meteorites to carry out his judgment. These, the, the, the rider on this horse is not given any description um, as, if it's, as if it's not important. He's there, but it's, he's not there, you know what <clears throat> what would What would God mean by not describing his rider? Well, a few ideas come up is that <clears throat> maybe the rider... Maybe the rider is the spirit. It's not something you can see. It's just generally a spirit. It's like you have people that are can be guided. You know, when Jesus threw spirits out of demons, out of uh, there was a spirit you couldn't see anything, but you know he's there. Right, it's the same description. He's there, but he's he's not there. Okay, and he had a bow. A bow. Is a weapon. It was well, not a weapon today. It probably still is, still is a weapon today, but a bow is used without an arrow, without arrows. So, so you're holding up, or uh, he, he had a bow with him. So he had a weapon with him and no ammunition. What good is a bow without any ammunition? And a crown was given to in, unto him. So he, he was. He was given, put in charge. He was put in charge of something. If a crown was given, we're not told what. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Right. If you go back in history, um, and you look at the biggest conquest, Alexander the Great, um, these, were, these, were, these, were, these were people that were called conquerors. And what did they do? They, they went on. They went to other countries and they basically invaded the country and took over the country. That's what a, that's what we as as human beings refer to as a conqueror. It probably wouldn't be on a personal scale, but probably more on an international scale. So you say a country would conquer another country. It's not more not, I wouldn't we wouldn't quite say a village conquering another village because that would be a problem entirely in its own that probably be sorted out by the police. But if a country went into another country, invaded the country, took over the country, then um, that would be that would be conquering. And if no other country disputed the fact that a country had been invaded, that country had been invaded, and actually took over the running of that country, then uh, that would be conquer. Because look, it says he went forth conquering, and to conquer. So he was doing it while he was thinking about doing some more of it, loosely speaking. 
Now, if you go back history, well, just look at current time. We look at the last 50 years. If, if a country, I remember Iraq, when Saddam Hussein was running around um, invading countries, uh, he actually went into Kuwait and he was given an ultimatum by the US, get out or we attack, and he did not, and he used the attack, and it actually eventually caused his downfall. This is the current event of things. We have organizations like the UN who, who would probably also be in a position to say, right, we condemn what you did, you get out, or we'll take, we'll do, we'll do some action with you, we'll, we'll, we'll either war against you, and most likely a country that invade another country would, would probably not have just that country as the enemy, but would probably have other enemies as well. Um, people or countries that were not enemies to begin with. And not only that, we have economic sanctions. So I know at the moment we heard that Taiwan is about ready to con uh, sorry, a Chinese about ready to conquer to Taiwan. Um, I don't it's not that I don't believe it, but if you look at the Chinese, they have interests, business interests in almost every country in the world. Why would they want to to destroy themselves with economic sanctions for one country? The fact that economic sanctions are, will be hanging over them is just one way they would be that they, they would be reprimanded and attacked back. So, so I think looking forward from here is that even at, at this particular time, most countries' borderlines have been drawn and have been set there for for ages. Uh, anyone wanting to conquer another country or another region, for that matter would be hard pressed to do so without having any repercussions uh, as a result. So if we if we look forward in the next 10 years, who would conquer who? And, and who would do that without any repercussion? I can't think of any, any state at the moment that would be in that position. So what I'd like to suggest is that if, if it's not going to happen, or most likely not happen. Maybe it has happened already. If you're all thinking what I'm thinking, well, look at Germany in the Second World War. How did that start? Right? So the Third Reich comes in, Hitler comes into power, and he decides he is going to be expanding Germany's borders. Well, that is uh, that is um, he went forth conquering and to conquer. He was his idea, his spirit, the spirit that took him was to conquer these countries and to and to run the countries. That's what he did to most of the European countries he went into. And here's the deal. I watched the series Willed at War at some stage, and it's old now, but I, I was very much interested at one stage. And in many of these countries, the German army drove in without a single shot being fired. Wouldn't that explain the bow without the ammunition? Right? He had ammunition, he had the, he, he had the means of doing it, but he took over the countries without a single fight, without a single shot being shot. And that's how it went with most countries. There was a bit of fighting in France, and, and of course, you had the Battle of Britain. So he, he, went, he went forth conquering. Now, notice the order of that. He, he conquered and to conquer. Well, he got to countries like, like Great Britain and other countries, possibly that I'm not aware of, that he conquered and and he couldn't conquer them. So his idea was to conquer them, but he never was able to. I believe because of the English Channel, probably had not been for the English Channel, he would have conquered England. So this white horse, as a rider, who is a spirit, and he uses a bow, just, just, just a show of weapons, and he is given authority 
to go forth to conquer and to conquer. Which of those of that verse does not include the Second World War or the German Third Reich and Hitler? And if so, it has happened. Well, let's look at the second. The, the, and let's look at the second seal. Maybe we can discredit the Second World War. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second D say, "Come and see." Also, probably with thunder, or John leaves it out. There's a conjunctive word again, Revelation four verse six, and, and. So this is built on the previous idea. Another horse was, that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon. Here again, the horse, the rider is not described. Another spirit to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Right, let's go take it verse, the, the, the first part of that verse 4. And there was, sorry, we read really described the horse, the rider was not described. We're not really much into it. It was a spirit to take peace from the earth. So when Hitler went on his annexation to conquer and to conquer, to conquer and to conquer, this was basically a declaration of war on the, on the free world. And to take, they set to take peace from the earth. If some, if a country did does today what Hitler did in the Second World War, that would take peace from the earth, and it did then, because I know one America was very hard pressed to get involved in the war and rather just wanted to supply Britain, but. That definitely put about an atmosphere of war. That there's a country that is trying to take over all other countries, and that we can't allow it happen. So people were thinking about this is not going to happen to us, and we're going to make a stand. When two countries make a stand against each other, that's called war. All right. And that they should kill one another. Well, that's what you do during a war. All right. That's you don't walk over to the other side and say, hey. Uh, would you mind, uh, you know, submitting to our demands and, 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 and no one will be killed. There's killing going on, right? So that they should kill. Notice that they should kill. They did not kill. Many times the watchmen say this has happened, that killing happens, right? That they should kill. That's not, that's not what it says. It's when a country declares war in another country. That is what he said, that we, are, we should kill your people. Okay, and and these were given unto him, and and was given unto him a great sword. Here again, the spirit is basically kicking off the first shot. Right, there's going to be attacks, and there's going to be defense, and there's going to be that's starting a war. So the so the so the red horse had everything to do with a war starting. The black horse, the previous verse. What started the war? Second verse, the war is starting. Right. Revelation 6 and uh, 6 verse 5. And when we had opened, and when he had opened the third seal, this is the lamb now. Remember, hunting is lost now. The lamb is still opening the seal. seal. I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld to a low black horse. And he and he he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Okay, so balances, as we know, this is the black horse, and the the spirit on this horse is carrying a balances. So, um, if, if ever we see balances, and we've seen them in sign, uh, uh, signatures signatures outside of courthouses, or always talking about. Judgment, right? So, um, I do not think that this is actually speaking of a judge. Uh, he's not bringing out judgment. He's basically, and the third be said, "Come and see." And I behold a low, and low a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. 
pair of balances is that if you go a bit forward, is that I believe um, Toledo, Ohio, is where the first balances or scales were 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 invented, where you had honest weight going on, or else they used to get defrauded by dishonest weights. And they invented the scale that would honestly weigh. So you, if you were buying a pound of gold, you would actually get a pound of gold and they would weigh in front of you and you would see that you're getting a pound of gold or whatever food stuff. So a pair of scales could very well be is that this is a time when things are going to be measured, right? Uh, the weights are going to be measured. Um, so um, it's got nothing to do with judgment. We know that because whatever comes off this doesn't speak about judgment. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And, and see thou heard not the oil and the wine. Okay, the English is a bit different there. Right, so he's not talking about judgment because he's talking here about food. Right, so have we been told? Well, this food is going to be scarce. Uh, in the in the end, it's going to be scarce. Well, look at this: a measure of wheat for a penny. So wheat, a measure. So what is used to measure? He had the scales on top, right? So let's say you had a sack of wheat, uh, sack is there, uh, for a penny. Penny is not much money. Um, and it's not certainly a day's wage, it's not in today's uh, standards anyway. And three measures of barley for a penny. Well, both barley and wheat are food. And we probably know that wheat is probably a staple diet. And barley, I don't know so much about a staple diet, but, um, but you saw that wheat will be more expensive, three times more expensive than barley, or maybe three times more accessible than barley would be. But we do know that the wheat is more expensive from from this from this from this verse. Wheat is is about three times more expensive than barley if you were to purchase it. And of course you had your scales to figure out because probably exact an exact measurement was was going to occur. And see thou heard not the oil and the wine. I was I was watching um, a series on uh, on YouTube, Dad's Army. It's kind of funny to me, probably because of my age, and also putting myself into that position of actually being an old timer and having to fight the war back at home. And and each of the series were quite funny, but what I did notice is that they had. They had uh, the rationing of food in that time, so the butcher had a had to ration the meat, and you had rations. You went to the, the store, and you you could only buy so much food. So food was severely rationed, and if you wanted anything else, anything extra, you had to basically bribe someone for it. But I also noticed that when they went to the pub to drink in the English old English pubs, is that the beer was never rationed. It was, hey, bring me up another draft or a, a pint of beer. The barman didn't ask him for a ration book. Well, here's what it says, that in that verse, and see that not hurt, or not affect, the oil and the wine. I'm not too sure what the oil would probably mean. Maybe someone can help me out there, but the wine would definitely mean uh, alcohol or socialized drinking. Now that happened in the Second World War. You you would you'd be rationed on food, but you weren't you weren't rationed on 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 the alcohol consumption. Getting back to the food, it was interesting to know that um, I I googled um, Second World War and wheat, and found that wheat was actually very uh, posters were made about was very restricted in those days during the war days, and civilians were encouraged to 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 abstain from wheat and rather mix the wheat water down to a third wheat and the other two thirds 
to use either barley or corn uh, cornmeal or potato or something like that. Um, probably didn't taste as nice, but it, that was your patriotic duty. It said, I think the, the poster went, uh, uh, save the fleet, um, cut down on the wheat or something to that effect. So they were actually encouraging civilians, listen, the wheat, or there was another post that says they, the, they are they're offering their lives, offer them the wheat. So the wheat was was severely rationed in those days. It, well, in Britain, I don't ever do it. I do know some of the victory cakes and stuff that they made, which was about making this change in the formula of bread and also including the bran, was uh, if, you didn't, if, you, if you ate the wheat, whole wheat, or sorry, if you ate wheat, just white bread, you'd be considered non-patriotic. So here we see that that wheat becomes scarce and therefore more expensive. If you, any of you taken economics at school, uh, if something's scarce, the price goes up. And if it's not so scarce, the price stays cheap. And this is what's happened to barley. Is the wheat is saved for the troops, the food. But not so much the wine and oil. I don't know about the oil probably is made to make the wheat. Um, that that had no, It's kind of a strange uh, uh, verse also to put in it. Um, you know, th th this is what's happened to the staple food, but do not do not do anything to the oil and the wine. In the time of a in, in time of a, a famine, you say, is there such a famine where bread and and barley are very expensive, but wine and and, and oil are excessive? Do you even have such a, a, a famine situation? In a war, you could. In a war, you could because they tend to they tend to serve the troops. With the special food because they're getting involved in the action. One can understand that. So Revelation 6 verse 6 fits also comfortably into the scenario that it could be World War II because this is exactly what happened. So I said, you've got to look at what it says and what it doesn't say, right? It doesn't talk about a famine and it doesn't talk about a judgment. It talks about what will happen during a normal war. Right, then we're going to go to the last verse in this video. And then I opened the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, no doubt, also with a thunderous voice. All right. And I looked, behold me, a pale horse, and the name that sat on him was death. The first time we are giving a characteristic of a rider is someone who's actually going to be visible and this is going to be seen occurring right and hell follows him with him terrible times death is down there collecting lives because the war has now broken out and hell falling behind to collect because most of those who died did not go to heaven very sad time. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger. Right, realize that and power was given unto them over the fourth of the earth. So in the Second World War, did all countries fight the war? Did all countries fight Germany? No. Most of the civilized world did. But if you had to collectively put together all the countries that were effectively involved in the war, in the fighting, it wasn't the entire world. It was called a world war because most of the free world was taking part. But if you had to estimate, yeah, about 25% of the world's countries were actually people, population, were actually at war. We're involved in the war in some way, either supplying it. I live in South Africa. Um, we we never saw a single bomber or a single shot being fired at the air, although some people might disagree. I, was, I wasn't born at the time. 
but um, we had no real great stories about this happened and that happened in this country. We we supplied England with with supplies and munitions and blankets and stuff like that. But uh, in that way, revolving, I believe some of the soldiers did did get involved in some parts of of the war, but very little, very little to actually mention. Right. And here's an important word, and power was given to them for the fourth part of the earth. We just discovered the fourth part of the whole world was at war. To kill with sword. Not killed, to kill. Right, so the fourth part of the world was at war, and their plan was to kill the other. Right, that's what war is normally about. And with hunger. So as a result of that, a lot of famine happened. Um, War is never a, a good thing to happen. Uh, we don't know much about, you know, who went without food, who didn't. Uh, it was probably not even mentioned in, in the press in those days. So they were more interested in the actual fighting than the civilians who were actually caught in the in the um, caught in the crossfires that had to flee places and then eventually get to places and there were no soup kitchens handing food out. You couldn't carry anything. How many people probably died of famine? Or what we would call, remember, um, just also take note, is that that the, the, they were killed with a sword and with hunger. Not with famine, right, with hunger. In other words, there probably was food, but they, these people died of hunger anyway. Okay? And, and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Well, a lot of people died in the Second World War. I don't think a real tally has been made up here. I haven't Googled it yet for how many people that were that, that would die. And with the beasts of the earth. Well, the beasts, here again, the Bible, Revelation not saying that the beasts attacked man with a lot of dead corpses lying around, you know, um, animals who were starving themselves probably helped themselves to corpses that were rotting along the side, or roadside in a house, source of food. So, um, none of that verse does not include World War II. In fact, if you take the entire four seals, you can probably say that that it, it, it even excludes World War One, because World War One was started with an incident, not with not with uh, um, conquering and to conquer. So that rules out World War One, but World War Two that puts it smack back in the middle, and everything that we've seen below this has in fact happened historically. It's historically true. And will it happen in future? As I mentioned in the video, I don't think so. Um, America has been involving itself in other countries' business for a while, and anyone knows who if they want to conquer another country that they probably will have to deal with America as well, uh, or any of the civilized countries who would probably put together a formidable force either of war or of sanctions. So it would be. Absolutely, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how evil you are, ludicrous for you to actually think that you're going to be getting anywhere by conquering another country. And simply those like North Korea who are, who have been under sanctions are just too weak to take over any other country, whether they have nuclear-powered missiles or not. That they could probably hit one bloodshot, but that's about it. They're going to get nailed, nailed if they if they even thought about uh, a victory in the end. There's, that that's just not possible. So, um, right, so we've talked about the first four seals. Now, notice that John is talking about, first of all, that these, that do, that these are not, uh, or, um, that these are writers, they're not, they're not the scribes, they're not carried out by angels. And one could say they carry out by ideas of men, spirits that came into their heads, conquering and to conquer. These are spirits, these are, these are the only writer that is described as death and hell that follows behind him, which obviously we know 
falls perfectly in line. Unsaved souls would probably be collected by, by hell or Hades. Um, right, this is the end of this video. Um, the next video, we will be talking about the, the fifth seal, which, by the way, is not, a, is not really a judgment. It's, it's more of an occurrence that happens in heaven. But we like to talk about why God is talking God is talking to the saints under the altar. Because whatever what God told them has got some effect on the on on, on, on future judgments, but not at the time, because God tells them to wait a little bit longer. Um, I'd like to leave a word of encouragement. Revelation six Verse 11, um, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. These saints complain to God for the vengeance, and God answers them. After, I notice this, after the first four seals have been broken, God answers them and says, according to, the, according to the King James Version, rest yet for a little season. Right, this is the message I'd like to get to saints around the world, rapture watchers. Hold that for yet a little season. God tells us that this is, when this has happened, it's not much time left you are on the end we are we are right there and the sixth seal is the most interesting one for for the saints uh, we'll get to that next we'll get to that in the following video